Hello everybody, and welcome to a new series on my channel that I will be calling Time Jump. This series will be discussing and analyzing the history of monsters throughout the Monster franchise and the various changes within its lifespan, all culminated by my thoughts on everything. An important thing to keep in mind will be the fact that Monster is ever evolving, and the monsters within will follow. So, don't be surprised if in the future you see a couple of revisits. With all that said, what better way to start off this new series than with the game that started it all for me? I've said it before time and time again, and I'll say it once more. I fucking love the third generation. Not just in nostalgia, but also for everything it brought to the table and advanced, especially in regards to the monsters. Very few within this generation have the displeasure of drawing my ire, with so many classics that hold a special place in my heart, and the serpentine terror of the sea is definitely one of them. This is a given, seeing how it is my first ever flagship, but besides that, I also find interest in Legiacris because of what he represents, for in context with the rest of the series, the beast tells a fascinating, if tragic story that simultaneously gives hope but also fear. So, to get an understanding of the sensation, why don't we look over the timeline of a creature to see what exactly I mean. Grab your favorite and preferable form of time travel, because we're jumping on the time of the Legiacris. The year is 2007 and Capcom has made the decision to switch the newest entry in their underrated gem of the series, Monster Hunter, from the PlayStation to the Wii in order to utilize the new revolutionary motion controls and technology, as well as hopefully gain a wider player base over in the West. This change would introduce a number of innovations, but most major of all being the emphasis on 3D vertical movement that we've never seen the likes of. This would allow for all new dynamic combat, environments, and monsters that wouldn't have been possible prior. And in a way, the Legiacris was created as a sort of emblem of this change. An emblem that represented a lot of aspects that at the time was completely new for us. A new classification in the form of the Leviathans, the first flagship to use the Thunder Element, the first to have a rivalry with the Raphalos, and of course, the first monster that we could actually fight in the water. Within the confines of a game, the Gaiacris serves as the primary antagonist and the main suspect behind the Moga Earthquakes, as well as just generally being an ass for any seaside village. And we get to know the Sweetie quite well, having perhaps the most dynamic beats in the story until the introduction of Gore. Yorks even prepared and out of the tutorial section of the game when the bastard invades a quest to get monster guts and completely changes the dynamic of the game. What was once your first laxative dip into the water, so to speak, is now dunked into the deep end with an electric generator powered crocodilian mosasaur. Even the NPCs in game is like, haha, nope, you can't even fight this thing, just run. So now, you have to spend your time trying to get the objective, all while ensuring that you aren't in one of the only two underwater zones that Laggy could be in. Such an invasive introduction really sets you out on the path to slay the beast, and over the course of a campaign and a warm-up round of the beast's not its full capabilities, you finally get the strength necessary to fell it once and for all. Now, it wasn't fully responsible for the quakes, that's Cedeus's albeit accidental fault, but hey, still more reason and rivalry for taking something down than with Velcana, which was for the sake of... Uh... Just because? As the metaphorical ambassador of underwater combat, Legiacris takes full advantage of a turf and requires immense amounts of patience and skill if you wish to triumph over him. Bites, drags, rushes sometimes powered by electricity to expand his range, double rushes, electric blasts, and his signature dynamo shocks are what you will be dealing with, all combined with a surprisingly fast monster given his size. Which leads me to an argument that I can... kind of see... and the main contention of the fur gen as a whole. Underwater combat and the movements you have. Now, for context, the main way I play fur gen is in the form of the Wii U gamepad, so I have no personal history with how it might feel on the 3DS. But for me personally, the controls handle just fine. 
Sometimes there are the occasional moments which I didn't expect or want to happen, but I've generally come to an understanding of what does what. Like for instance how dodging right after a dodge will generally make your hunter go up. And personally, the movement underwater forces me to take a more methodical approach. Of course a sea creature would have the advantage of a sea, that's kind of the whole point. You can't just simply beat a bear in its nest. You'll have to approach the hunt differently to even survive. Much less, you can't just simply rush a Legiacris like how you'd rush down as a Nogur. Look for the openings you know will be optimal and strike while the iron's hot, memorizing the monster's movements and patterns all the while. Now, that doesn't mean I find it perfect, fuck no. I definitely have complaints from time to time, but it isn't so obtrusive to where it ruins my fun. More importantly, Legiacris further emphasizes my point through his own title and namesake, the Lord of the Seas. He is to water as... <sighs> Unfortunately, the sky and flying is to Raffalos. They are the big giant apexes of their respective domains that no way can you tackle like any other monster, and will surely test your skills trying. Luckily, unlike Raphalos, Legiacris does have two other versions that offer up different experiences depending on what your tastes are. Ivory for an extremely land-focused encounter, and Abyssal if you want your armor head-to-toe flooded with water. It is this factor, however, that would kill Legiacris for quite some time, as due to the reception of underwater combat and the team moving on to the successful mounting approach of 4, any hope for laggy returning quickly died out. He would make appearances sometimes, but never as a full-on fight that we could experience, just materials and armors we could get, always teasing us out of something that could never happen. Unless if underwater combat was brought back and massively changed, they would never bring back Legiacris, and he would forever remain stuck as a relic of a bygone era. That is, until generations came along. On the 2nd of September, 2015, the newest Famitsu article came out detailing all the newest and hottest things to know about the upcoming anniversary game, Monster Hunter Generations. Content within it ranged from details on the styles and locations, to the new Mufa pet, returning monsters like Shogun and Blanganga, and a featurette on one of the faded four, Astalos. But the star for me, and plenty of others, was the announcement that after almost three years of being stuck in purgatory, our boy Legiacris had finally found his way out and was making a triumphant comeback. Even now, it still stands as one of the hypest moments in Monster Hunter history for me, and I was so glad I could just be able to fight him again. But without Underwater, Legiacris had to be revamped massively to fit within the game and work. A major problem of Laggy, subs aside, was the fact that on land, he wasn't the biggest of threats, having the most basic of slides, snaps, bites, breath, and pulses. So to fix this issue, the team decided to give way more firepower to the serpent to make up for the missing half of his arsenal. Literally. Laggy's main bread and butter in Gen and Gen Yu was the multiple pulses and blasts he could pull out that cover quite a bit of area and do some serious damage. Along with that, he was also able to create three spinning orbs around him, electric tripwires, and in G-Rank, a very powerful, delayed bite that would launch you. And I'm gonna be honest, I really don't like this version. I understand that they had to compensate for half of his moveset being gone and making him more challenging, but it is so stale and annoying when more than half of his moves equate to electric explosions in some form. Explosions from an orb here, explosions here that expand out into even more pulses, even bigger explosions that cover like half of your arena and what might as well be an explosion with his rocket launch bite, certainly isn't helped when these attacks happen so frequently within the fight combined with Thunder Blight and the reach he has. Now, my argument here isn't the existence of these attacks. No, in fact, a Leviathan can work with this in mind. My proof? Well, there is this little card that I can pull out of my ass. Um, uh, let's see, it should be here somewhere. Um, if only I could find it. Ah, here it is. <coughs> I've played Frontier. 
Allow me to bring up two examples to my point. Kuwaru Sapusu and the best Kezu to exist, Boruda Guru. Both have a focus on attacks with a big visual effect, but they balance it out for their mechanics and moveset. Boruda Guru with his blood sucking an ailment stockpile, and Kuwaru for the manipulation of a Highlands Weather with his crystals. They have variety in their attacks and main gimmicks to ensure the fight never stays dull always having a movement or rhythm to it. Legaiacris doesn't exactly have that same pleasure. He barely has any movement to him, and even though the use of his dynamo I would consider his main gimmick, here we have attacks comprising of a dynamo taking up 85% of his moveset. Not even Ivory, who was basically the first land Legaiacris with a similar focus, was the static. What didn't help matters further was the limited approach because of his moveset. Certain styles didn't exactly work the best for specific monsters, and Legiacris is very much one of them. If you chose anything other than Valor or Adept, you are in for a rough time, as you'll barely be able to close the distance and stay in for too long with the frequency he bursts. You could try and aerial it, but that would require immense knowledge of his moveset and the timing to it. The only other way you could deal with it was either by staying far enough away or in safe spots, or blocking. Yes, that's the general consensus when it comes to big attacks like that, I know, but when they happen so frequently, it honestly gets tiresome. And considering the pace of this game and the styles, I certainly don't get the impression that this is supposed to be handled slowly like with, say, Abyssal. But among all this, there is one thought and idea that made me ultimately decide to write this as the pilot episode. I remember a time when I and so many other laggy fans across the globe squealed in excitement over the boy finally making a comeback. It seemed like something that wouldn't happen for a very long time. Yet, here he was, showing the world that he wouldn't be missing out on the party. At first, I was just happy to be finding him once again, and I quite enjoyed the fight and what it did to beat him up. It wouldn't be until the end of Generations in Hyper Legiacris where I began to take notice of a couple of issues with the fights. But at the time, I just chalked it up to Hyper Legiacris and not the base monster itself. Then came along G Rank and the realization that it wasn't just Hyper. It was Legiacris' entire foundation of this game. The gigantic lack of variety in his moveset, the damage and range he gained as a way to artificially bump up the difficulty, the frequency of these attacks which then led to Thunder Blade and Stun, everything about it just ended up annoying me by the end, even with something like Valor Longsword. But why did this all feel odd to me if the laggies previously also had similar things going for them? It wasn't until a comparison someone made whether in Discord or in conversation, or of a reason as to why sunk in. Legiacris in Gen Yu is simply a more ranged, scaly, prettier Kezu under the namesake of Legiacris. Without the availability of water, the title that defined Legiacris means nothing, no longer seen as the Lord of the Seas, the iconic Nordic sea serpent of legend for the Monster Hunter world. Here he is, just another landlocked leviathan with no water to call home. And no monster, NO MONSTER should be reminding me of Kezu! But... Here we are. By the end of all this, after suffering a complete 180 on this version and the removal of Legiacris from World, I'm torn. Part of me wants Legiacris in underwater combat to be given a second chance, a redemption arc to improve, better themselves after the waves of criticism and be shown more love. But another part knows, judging from Capcom's strange safe pickings for third gen reps and how disliked third is, especially in Japan, when compared to one and two, that underwater combat is not very likely to return. Thus, if Laggy were to ever come back, he would have to be overhauled yet again, putting himself at risk once more at losing his identity and the fun I remember oh so well. And I don't know if I would want to take that risk. I both simultaneously want him back, but I also don't in fear that it'll be yet another hollow imitation. One thing is for certain, however, 
At least I'll always have the memories and countless hours to look forward to in this little brick of facing the three of them again and again. But these are just my thoughts on the timeline and evolution of Laggy. So tell me, what are yours? Do you share my sentiments and worry over the future of Lagiacris? Are you optimistic and hopeful? Do you prefer the old despite its occasional clunk? Or do you enjoy the new focus and spin taken with him? Please feel free to let me know and talk amongst each other in the comment section below so long as it remains civil. With all that out of the way, I have been the Monarch of Dragons, and I hope you all have a fantastic day, slash night, wherever you live. Peace.